stand up and say, try, test, fail, tweak, try, test, fail, tweak. Come on. My goal for this is to inspire you to try something new. I'm growing <laughs> palms. I'm growing leaves. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to waste a crisis. I think you said that. <laughs> but man, if I could just get you to catch a whiff of this pair. You're going to have to hold on to your hats. Yeah, absolutely. I learned so much from St Stefan's last talk. Yeah. It was so inspirational. It's like, if you just, he's basically told you to get off the computer and go actually do something. Yeah, absolutely. But not until after you watch his talk, though. Yeah, not until after. Okay, I'm going to bring him in. And I'm excited for this one. <clears throat> Stefan, how's it going? Hi there, Rob. Very good. Very good. Good. You caught a couple of the talks? I did not. We had our last open day at the farm today. So I've been busy. Yeah, we've been busy. This was the last. So our season's done. Fantastic. It was nice. It was, it was a good nice. Season? It's been amazing. We've been giving people 160 pounds of free apples to what? everybody who's a member. <laughs> wow. Most people. Actually, this time, uh, a lot of people took advantage because I really emphasized that they should come with friends and family. Just fantastic. It's been a great season. Awesome. COVID's been good. <laughs> <laughs> been good. I, I, I think you're the one, Rob, that I heard it the first time that it's a terrible thing to waste a crisis. I think you said that. <laughs> and yeah. it, it really is. You know, don't waste those crises, boy. They're really... They're, they're so important. They're so useful and uh, don't let them go to waste. Absolutely. Yeah, you got it. Cool. Well, uh, let's read uh, Stefan's uh, bio and let's uh, let him take it away. So uh, a biologist, landscape architect, educator, filmmaker, farm manager, husband, father of three. Man, what's with these overachievers? <laughs> they just make me feel so useless. <laughs> Uh, we got to compete with these guys. They're living 40 lives. Um, Stefan Subkobiak wears many hats and is highly influential, a highly influential permaculturist in his region. He has lectured with McGill University, is a special guest in the Verge Permaculture upcoming PDC, and is currently the director of Miracle Farm, the renowned permaculture orchard in Quebec. And if you haven't seen Stefan's video, I highly recommend you go pick up a copy if you have any intention. Oh, it's so of, good. Yeah, it is amazing. If you have any intention of setting up an orchard of your own, it's a video that you're going to want to have. It's one of those references that's going to stand the test of time. So without further ado, Stefan, please take it away. Today, it's really all about something very simple, but it's really how to design a permaculture lab. I like to say, you know, I... I kind of started the farm as a lab because I just needed to experiment things that were really way, let's just say, they were so far out of the mainstream that uh, first time I did a proposal, I got laughed out of basically just, you know, they just laughed so hard that they said, we had such a great laugh on your behalf. So that's really why you need a lab. You need a place that, uh, you can try things. So my goal for this is to inspire you to try something new. And I've tried, geez, I've tried a lot. When Rob, when you said, you know, uh, I'm not overachiever. I've just been at it for longer than a lot of people. That's all. And when you're at it for a long, as long as I have, you will have a chance to do a whole bunch of things. Touche. So that's that, you know, I think Rob, uh, I think I've got 20 years on you. So that's all it is. In 20 years, what you've started with the greenhouse, man, it's going to be, we're going to be able to go through the next ice age. I'm pretty confident of that. Uh, so I want people to get the handle on being able to apply something you already know, because a lot of times we know so much, we need to apply some of what we know. So I really want to inspire people to try something new. And a few keywords for this, and you'll see this repeated again and again, is try, test, fail, and tweak. So let's try this together. Stand up, stretch. Everybody, you can stretch, stand up, and say, try, test, fail, tweak, try, 
test, fail, tweak. Come on. Try, test, fail, tweak. That's the whole essence of it. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to try, test, fail, and tweak if you want to have a permaculture lab. That's really what it comes down to. So there's four, four parts to this. Understanding what's involved in designing a permaculture lab, that's the basis. That's the first part. Then it's really relating to you. Does it suit you and your character? Ooh, it's not necessarily for everyone, but I want you to do a little quick soul searching on that one when we get there. The third part is uh, a little bit of getting you involved in your lab, what's involved with that, and some homework for your lab. So that's, that's the four parts. It's, it's to get going. I love Bill Mollison's quote where he says, productivity within a system is only limited to the information and imagination of the designer. We're the ones who are holding back our system from being able to be more, more productive, uh, less energy usage, more diversity. I mean, this is really our imagination and the information. So you're here, you're listening, you are part of those willing to put in some time because you do have to put in some time to learn, to get bits of information, you know, take down some notes, put down a few to-dos on there, maybe set a few goals. So the first part, what's involved in designing your permaculture lab? Hey, what is a lab? Well, you think, oh, a lab, yeah, I've, I've seen that when I was in high school, you know, it's these beakers and that's a chemistry lab and that is one type of lab. We're talking for the living environment. And it's really a place that you can, what? Try, test, fail, tweak. That's what you're really here to do. If that's what you're thinking of having as a lab, that's what you will go through. You'll try things, you'll test things, and you will fail, but you can tweak and try again. So failure, I want you to get so comfortable with failure because failure is the price you pay. It's the price of admission for trying something new. And I can tell you that I've seen a lot of comments over the last few years. And I find that the, the pointiness of details on comments is inversely proportional to the number of attempts and plantings that the person has done. <laughs> So it's really the price of admission of trying something new. And another one is a crackpot is one failure away from being a genius. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So, oh, this person's a crackpot. It's, he's crazy or she's a nutcase. Until the day that somebody goes, oh, my goodness, they are a genius. Why? Because they were willing to continue with failure until they got it. Hey, how many thousands of years ago did King Solomon say there's nothing new under the sun? So, you know what? The, that's really the case. There is nothing new. What we're often in a situation is we're often just rediscovering what was once known. <clears throat> I got this one from Uncle Bill's famous book. You know, the permaculture designer's manual, you go to Dryland's chapter. And those of you who don't have this book and you're here to hear about hope and a plan, get your textbook, get your, your really your starting book. And this book is really the starting place. You will, it's the basis of PDCs. It's, it's really the basis of permaculture. If, you say, well, I don't know. I don't really need the book. You, it will open your mind on so many possible things. And why do you have to invent it when you think, oh, you know, I came up with this, this system and it's just a bunch of these things on a hillside. And then you'd look at it and you go, you know what? This is nothing new. Mollison put it in his book because it's been known for eons. 
And that's really what we need to do sometimes is rediscover what was once known. So often it's like that. And this year I was listening, Elon is one of my heroes in the sense of he is somebody who really likes innovation. And he said something that I thought, I never thought of it that way. He said, technology doesn't always progress. If there's no continued effort and discovery, it regresses. I thought, oh my gosh, that's true. And it applies to agriculture. It applies to growing. If you're not continuing to do and add and discover, then the practices that were done may get lost. What permaculture principles most represent a lab? Have you ever thought of that? Which ones most represent a lab? Let's see. Can I get a quick one in the chat here? Creatively use and respond to change. Okay. Observe. Aha. All right. So we got that one. Observe and interact. There's one more. That's a real key. The dirt dad one says one obtain a yield. Teresa says observe and interact. Uh, observe, observation, observe. Earth care, that's, a, that's an ethic. Seek and utilize feedback. Uh, the problem is the solution, all of them. All of them. Well, certainly some more than others. Let's go through them. So the observe, interact, I find that one is, is really, it's the first, it's the basis, it's the start of it all. Oftentimes for a discovery, just being able to observe something, oh, you go, I didn't know that. I never thought of that and you observe what's going on, and that is the seed. Often an observation is the seed for most great discoveries, actually. It just starts so simply, but it, it works. Another big one going upwards in the numbers, four, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. It's really that, what was the one that I say? Try, test, fail, and tweak. Well, the fail is important for the feedback loop. You try something, you accept the feedback, which means, oh, it didn't work. It's not a failure. It's feedback. You know, David Holmgren could have written that as apply self-regulation and accept failure. It's exactly that. You're accepting that it's a failure, the one I did. You accept, you do a feedback loop, go through it again, and come up with what's next. Design from the pattern to details. You know, you start off with an idea. The idea can encompass so much. I'm sure when Rob was thinking of this summit, he didn't come up with every detail. He said, you know what? Let's do another summit and this one on the themes that, that were proposed. So that's, what, that's how it starts. You want the big picture, the idea, and then you work out the details. Don't sweat the small stuff when you're first starting, that'll come. All right, so what's the difference between a lab and production? I consider our farm to be a lab. So we called it the permaculture orchard and it is definitely very different. I mean, we had one of the largest uh, uh, organic apple orchards in the, in the province and it was not what we have now. I can guarantee you it definitely was not. So here's a comparison of the permaculture orchard. So you have biodiversity, trees, shrubs, perennials. You have a permanent mulch strip for crops. You have aisles, which are managed for beneficial insect, which can be with the help of animals or mechanically. Uh, you have fruit drops that can be eaten by animals or gathered for them. I much prefer that they're eaten by the animals. And then you have a typical apple orchard where it can produce a huge tonnage with a lot of costs and a lot more intervention. But there is, there is a difference. There is a difference. And I was also struck when Elon said that he looked at manufacturing and he said it is a hundred times, or did he say a thousand times, easier to do a prototype than a production system. When I heard that, I thought, oh my gosh. So I'm working on the prototype and he's saying a hundred times harder to have it as a production system. Maybe not a hundred times in the case of growing, but certainly harder. 
Uh, although the prototype is hard, don't get it wrong. It's not like, yeah, the first thing I tried worked and I'm going to turn it into a production system. Yeah, not usually. You have to what? Try, test, fail and tweak. That's what you have to do. So I really have a huge respect for successful and profitable farm producers, mostly because of their management skill. I mean, this person has, has really done an amazing job, probably a civil pasture, you know, there's trees and there's the grass underneath that, that he grazes uh, with his cattle or cattle goats or sheep or sheep goats, whatever, or maybe wildebeest and elephants. Yeah, that's, that's really what it comes down to. The management skill in a production system is impressive. And I like to say, I am a terrible producer, not because I want to be, but because there's three things needed to be a very good producer in terms of agriculture. One, you have to know what needs to be done throughout the year. You have to know what needs to be done. Second, you have to know when to do it. So, okay, I know what, okay, you have my whole list of the year. These are the things that have to be done. You have to know the second one when they have to be done. And that's really important when you're talking living systems. And the third one is you have to do them. <laughs> and I hate to be so simple, but it's, I got the first two. I know what needs to be done and I know when they need to be done, but it's doing them that I fail at most often pretty miserably. So. I know what needs to be, and I, I, that's why I say I'm not a great producer, because great producers can really master those three. They know what needs, they know when, and they get out, and they organize, and they manage a team to get it done. So those are the, the really important things. Prototyping versus production system, there is a massive difference. So just keep that in mind. If you're thinking of a lab, you want to start something, you want to do it, it's not the same. Producing it in a, in a consistent way is a very different kettle of fish. For example, in apples, and that ha has been one of the areas that I've spent some time on. This is a very typical uh, apple model. So you grow a cultivar, in this case, Gala apples, on M9 rootstock in a high density. High density means you'll grow at about 2,000 trees per acre. So this is a pretty time-proven production system. If your soil is right and so on, and you have, you know, there's, some, there's some fine uh, details involved in it, but this is often the way it's done. And you compare that to what I've been doing in the permaculture orchard, uh, it's not at all the same. I mean, I'm testing so many things. I'm testing the trios. And if some of you know of the things I've done, uh, the trios it used to call it the nap because I started off with this model. And when I drew it on paper, it ended up, it was, oh, here's an N for the nitrogen fixer. And next to it, I'll put an apple and next to it, I'll put a pear or a plum. And so I said, hey, look at that. On the planet, it came up as NAP, NAP, and so on. So I thought, hey, if this works, maybe I'll be able to go take a nap. That was the basis. But I don't call it nap. It was a catchy term, but I prefer to refer to them as trios because it's more than just nitrogen and two fruit trees. There's other, a lot of other combinations. But we need to rediscover what worked for centuries and it's too bad the, that we don't have good records of things that happened 2000 years ago and exact details of how they did it or even the major points of how they did it or what did they combine with what it's too bad i hope that what we're learning now will be kept and as long as we don't have an electromagnetic pulse from a solar flare that wipes out all digital media, we'll be pretty good. I'm not throwing out my books exactly for that reason, because you know what? If we have such a pulse and they have happened in the past, 
we'll have to refer to things like the books to get our information because the digital media will be fried. I don't mean to be scary. It's just, that's a fact of life. Look it up. So let's look at the permaculture orchard as the prototype, as one example. There was three main concepts we used in it. The first one I briefly explained is trios. Okay, so we called it NAP and it's a nitrogen fixer, two fruit trees. But now I call it trio because you can have a nitrogen fixer, one fruit and one nut, or you can go nuts and have a nitrogen fixer and two nuts. However you want to qualify it, the idea is this is your repeating pattern for an orchard or for fruit or nut rows. So that's the pattern. I mean, permaculture is a lot about patterns. You find a pattern and you just repeat it. The second concept is layers. I mean, hey, food forests, it's all about layers and it gets pretty complex in the number of layers. I keep things simple. So I say, you know what, let's talk about three. So I use a trio vertically. We have the horizontal trio and a, verti and a vertical trio, trees, shrubs, and perennials. But I've added one. So we now consider it as a trio plus one. So the climbers in the case of grape and kiwi is another layer that we're getting out of it. And the third concept is what I call the grocery store concept because we're a you pick farm. So people are used to walking down an aisle and picking things up from both sides. We're grocery store minded often. Well, why don't we make the farm to be the same system? So you have an aisle and you have two grocery store. Some things are low as the case of perennials and some things are higher as the case of fruit trees. So what we do is we simply batch all of the trees that are ripe in a given 10 day window. So that's the grocery store concept and it works and it makes things a lot simpler. So part of prototyping is working out details so that think of the end user, think of how it will work out in the end. I love Uncle Bill's three phases of abundance. I mean, if you've never come across his three phases of abundance. I did a video on it on YouTube, but go see his original document. And I link it in my video, what the exact, uh, it's at Permaculture News, I think. And it is incredible. He goes through, and this is what you'll go through over about a seven year period. First of all, you'll have an abundance of diversity, or you will have to invest in an abundance of diversity. We're talking species, and cultivars. So you're putting a mix of plants in there. And this is really the test phase. So this is where you're, I guess you could say you're prototyping, you're trying a lot of things out. Then you're evaluating, right? You're going through the feedback loop. Yeah, these things really work well. Oh, this doesn't work well at all. Yes, no. And if it is a yes, then you get to the second phase of abundance, which you will end up with an abundance because the winners, the plants that do really well, they do really well and they multiply and they spread and they, produce, they grow well. So they give you material for cuttings, for graft uh, material, for propagules, for seeds, for tubers, for whatever. So this is the phase where you basically can be very picky what material you use. You can just pick the best cutting material you can just pick because you've got an abundance. And if you've never gone through even the first phase, but this phase of abundance, abundance is amazing. I mean, I wish everybody experiences what abundance is. It's really the case where you go, you know what? I can give so much plant material away because you know what I'm pruning it off and I'm just putting it in a pile anyway so you know what people need propagation material sure I can sell it I can give it I can do whatever I want because I've got an abundance of it and the third phase and this is the final phase now you've selected so your winners you've taken a lot of propagation material off your winners and now you reach a point where you're letting them finish. You're letting them go vegetative. 
and you get to a stage where you're going to have an abundance of yield. An abundance of yield is really an abundance. I had this before, uh, before we started. It isn't always the prettiest fruit, but man, if I could just get you to catch a whiff of this pear and a taste, it is buttery soft. I mean, this is amazing. That's what you want. You want not just yield, not just tonnage, but quality. You want people to go, wow. You know, they'll take a bite and they go, oh my God, how many people I've heard this year say, this is, this is the best one I've ever had. We just had one comment today. Somebody said, you know what? Your eggs are amazing. It was the best eggs I've ever had. That's what you want. You want abundance of yield and basically abundance of feedback of quality. People understand nutrient-dense food by taste. So let them taste. All right. So that's his three phases of abundance. I would add a couple. My addition would be tests an abundance of densities. Because if you're in a tropical or subtropical, that isn't so much of an issue. You can plant really dense and you'll get away with it because you have a lot of plants that do well in the shade. Even though it's dense, they're shaded, they'll still do well because they need a lot more shade. In a temperate climate, and I've seen traveling through Europe, south of France is kind of a limiting point. You get to the middle or northern France or that part of Europe, and you realize that, yep, there is a point where sun becomes a limiting factor. And in our climate, I mean, we're, we're in a, <clears throat> a winter climate. We hit our coldest since we've had the farm is minus 38. So that is pretty darn cold. And so I'd say we're in a winter climate. And in that case, we are winter, uh, not winter, but we are sun limited. And so you want to keep in mind how dense you plant. And we're seeing now, after we've planted, we're seeing now that, you know what? I didn't expect our plantings to grow so well. I didn't expect without fertilizing that they would grow so big, so wide, and so abundant, but they have. They actually surpassed what I, I was expecting. So remember that a plant that is surviving because it's too dense, it is not thriving, at least not in a temperate climate. Test different species combos as well. You want to reach that abundance? Well, you've got things to test. And species combos is you have your nitrogen fixer and let's say a nut and a fruit. Well, what species are you using? You want to test as many as you can because you'll see some that, yeah, gee, these are, that's really doing well. If you have a small space, that's all right. Just try a few that you've seen perhaps in the neighborhood that work well. And that is the key one. You really want to know, by all means, observe your site, observe your neighborhood and what grows there naturally. Naturally means, you know what, when we have a cherry pitfalls, I mean, it grows and cherry trees grow crazy. That's what our site is, actually. We're not even a place where there is no wild apple trees growing on our property and in any surrounding for a few kilometers around, there's no wild apple trees. Everyone has to be planted because it's just too dry and sandy for apple, even for pear. Plum trees do and cherry trees do, but cherries and grapes especially. So that is something if I can, you want to take a note, take a note of this one. Observe what grows naturally. And naturally plant that first. Why? Because these are the ones that come on. If it's growing wild everywhere, if you have cherries growing wild everywhere and you plant the cherry, chances are that cherry will do really well. Give it the same conditions. For example, in our case, we're putting our cherry trees or we put our cherry trees originally in the rows with apple and we water enough for apple but that's too much for cherry trees. And we've seen some, some things come up in the cherry trees that are just a symptom of too much water. So 
you think, well, you know, the combos try to get in the same moisture range for combos as well. Okay. What are the steps of the lab? Well, try something radical, have a big goal. We tried in the beginning with sheep. We put sheep, silvopasture. It worked really well. If you have a monoculture, this grows great, but you will have trees and grass and sheep in between, nothing more. So it, there is a phase or there is a way to grow things with animals like that. And it's not in a multiple uh, diversity of layers that it will work. Try putting in some large trees, you know, that could work. Whatever you do, try to have a big impact. A big goal is important. Just try moving the needle. My big goal was to produce fruit at scale in a way that's regenerative and favor more wildlife. That was, that was something that had to happen. It had to encourage more wildlife. I'm a wildlife biologist. I love seeing wildlife in all its forms. And that was an important part, an essential part of my original goal. And my inspiration was really Molson's book. So get that book, you know, my goodness, it's such a, it's not an easy read. I mean, it's easy read, but it's, there's a lot in there. You can spend a whole winter and winter's coming for those of you in the North. So take time to get back to your basics. And in the book, in Molson's book, there is one chapter on tempered climates. And this one diagram in the book was actually the inspiration for our orchard. So I studied this and I looked at how he set it up. And one thing kind of always bothered me, he would put a fruit tree. So this is a fruit tree. And then he would put an interplant or a nitrogen fixing plant. And then he'd have a fruit tree and an interplant and a fruit tree and an interplant and so on. So he would have fruit nitrogen. So his design was NF, NF or FN, 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 uh, however you want to look at it. So fruit, nitrogen, fruit, nitrogen, uh, that was the pattern. So that was his pattern. And I thought, you know what, maybe because uh, our nitrogen fixers at that time, I didn't have any that I could use that would give us fruit. So half of our area would be non-fruiting. And so I decided maybe we could just stretch it. So we would have our nitrogen fixer. So here's our nitrogen fixer. And then we would have two fruit trees. And the next trio would be a nitrogen fixer and two fruit trees and so on. And the first um, trio has different cultivars from the second trio and so on and so on down the road. So that's the idea of the patterns of trios that I just stretched it. So that's all I did. I adopted his technique and his idea, but I just stretched it. So you know what, in the end, just start, just start. You're listening to this, write down something that you can just start today or this weekend. It's weekend. You're going to be listening. Okay. What can you start? You're getting motivated by all these presentations. What can you start? Okay, I'll give you a break. Not today, but this week. Write down what it is you can start this week towards your journey. Let me see. Do I get any comments on that? Yeah, your inspirations are YouTube videos and books. But what can you start? Write them down. Start. Just start. Starting to get information. But I did say I wanted to move you from knowing to applying what you know. Oh, come on, guys, gals. What is it you can just start? I'll give you 10 more seconds to write down something you can just start. <laughs> Get rabbits. Have a herb garden. Start a worm farm. Look for nitrogen fixers. Plant more flowers. Hey, you're on a roll. Wow. I love it. I love it. Get some garlic here. This is the time. Worms. You know what? That's often how it starts. It just starts. But until somebody kind of pegs you to it. And, you know, there's, there's a magical thing in teaching about writing. 
because just the fact of having written it down, so now you wrote it in the chat and now you may not have it anymore. So everyone who wrote something, get yourself somewhere or put it in an app that you can have it. And you know, one of the best ways I've ever found is to take your phone and make it your screensaver so that for that week, you're going to see it every time you turn on your phone. You want motivation. It's, you're going to go, why did I write that? Now I've got to do it. That's right. You've got to do it. Great. And you can start small enough to convince you. A prototype can be something so small. I recommend people start. If you want to get into something that I've been talking about, the permaculture orchard, start with two trios. Why? Because it's something you can honestly plant in a day or at most in a weekend. And it's not that super expensive to do. But boy, let me tell you, the only regret you'll have is that five years from now or six or seven, depending on what you plant, the only regret is you'll go, why didn't I plant more of this or of that? And in the case of the shrubs underneath, you'll say in three years ago, oh gosh, I should have planted more of these. That is a good, that's a good regret because you go, you know what? I started when I did. And the only thing is I should have done more of. Learn all along the way. It's the opposite of perfectionism. It really is. This was when we got our nursery completely eaten down. But you know what? That's learning. Set some metrics. For us, it was tent caterpillars. When we were organic, it was this was our nemesis. And now I am excited to see them because they've disappeared. So that is the metric. You have some measure that will let you know, or am I moving in the right direction? Just to give you a quick tweak on some of the steps for us for the future. So I've kind of set my goal the next three years till I want to tweak fertility. I want the orchard to be brimming with health so that it gets to the point where it repels insects and disease. So that's where now I've tested, I've tried, I've failed. And now I want to tweak this one specific thing, which is fertility. And one of my mentors for this is really John Kemp. If you don't listen to John Kemp, go see his podcast, K-E-M-P-F. Fantastic, fantastic information. So how am I going to tweak it? I'm going to add compost tea again. It's been, I realized it's been over 15 years since we applied compost tea. Rock dust, it's been almost 30 years since we used rock dust at the farm. Biochar, we've done that in the last few years, but not at, at scale. Foliar feeding, we've been doing some, minimal. Uh, and fertigation is something I want to add because we have an irrigation system and we can simply add fertigation is fertilizing in through your, your irrigation system. Does a lab suit you and your character? Hey, you know what? The mind can't absorb more than the seat can endure. So I want you to repeat. What's the four words? Try, test, fail, and tweak. Get up and sing it. Try, test, fail, tweak. Try, test, fail, tweak. Try, test, fail, tweak. You know what? Ah, already it feels better. Good one. I'm glad I did it for myself, unless some of you joined me. Hey. Are you somebody, now this is the characters, are you somebody that you don't give a damn about what are, others will think? You know, public, almost you'd think humiliation? Ha, <laughs> that's all right. It's part of, you, you take someone like Elon, I mean, he is used to failures. He makes it his, his modus operandi. Maybe you just want to prove something to yourself. You think, you know what, I would just want to see. I said, I wanted to see if I could get birds to eat out of my hand. And sure enough, you know, it worked. Uh, now they come everywhere I walk on the farm, we get birds coming to eat out of our hand, which is nice. And it's, that's just something. Set yourself, know yourself, and are you curious? Are you just curious? I've always been curious. And so we had this one pest. And, you know, hey, we got this pest. What do we do? You know, this fly, it's apple maggot fly. It really can destroy our crop. So uh, 
many years ago, we started just a simple crude trap and we tweaked it and we tweaked it. And this is version nine, I believe. And now we actually sell these traps because there's nothing better on the market, honestly. They're, the, they're incredibly effective traps against this fly. Are you not afraid of failing or do you need a cure for fear of failure? You think, oh, you know, I'm, uh, I don't like failing. School teaches us that failure is bad. It should be the opposite. School should teach us that failure is essential. We have to fail. Don't worry about it. Get over it. Get it. Be, have a, be immune to the idea of fearing failure. That's where you really want to get to. Because you will fail many times. It's the very nature of experimenting. If you want a lab, if you want even a part of your yard to be a little experiment, then get used to the idea that you will fail. It is essential. Let me give you an example of how I've grown through the journey. You know, it's not, it's not, it's a journey. I had perfectionism. I was in science and science is measure and test. And you know what? When I started with the farm, I realized I had to choose between get it perfect or get it done. And you know what? There were other tasks that were waiting and piling up. So you have the choice. And until I heard Joel Salton and he had the, the mindset of, you know what? It's not pretty, but it's good enough. And I was, that was liberating. And yeah, go listen to what Joel Salton has to say. Go read his books. It's incredible. It, he's been at it for a long time and he knows what's involved. And I saw it, that's what I did. I mean, this isn't a pretty turkey roost, but you know what? It's good enough, and the turkeys certainly loved it. What others think? Well, let me give you a, a reality dose. I didn't show or talk about the permaculture orchard for five years after I first planted it. I mean, I was completely zipped. Why? Because I myself wasn't convinced. I had to, and my metric was the caterpillar. I had to go through two cycles of caterpillars to know that, you know what? This is working. It's working against what was the worst insect in our orchard. And it was like, hmm, if it's working for this, something is working. It's headed in the right direction. And that gave me really a rooted conviction. You have to, if you have an idea, you have to get that idea rooted which means once it's rooted, it doesn't matter what other people say. So for five years, I didn't need people's comment of coming and saying, that's crazy, that'll never work. I didn't know myself if it would work, so I didn't need their input on that. And it opened up new opportunities. I mean, gee, when, then when we decided to talk about it, uh, we came out with the film, and that was a huge success. And yeah, as Rob said, you know, if Listen, it's I think it's you could get it for $9.95 or something like that. Get the film if you're at all interested in learning about fruit trees, the permaculture orchard beyond organic. I mean, please. Uh YouTube, that was I never set up. And when I hear young young kids now talk about that's the most desired thing they want to do. I want to be a YouTuber. I never even set out with that intention. It was just now that we, I was convinced and I wanted to get the word out, I looked around what would get the word out so people could start their own project. Hey, YouTube's pretty good for that. Let me just start. And it was just start. If you go see some of our earliest videos, you'll see, wow, I really just started crude and I started in English and in French. Uh, yeah, you know what? Just start. And now it's branched out. I mean, we've got uh, tours that we go on teaching tours all around the world. And you never knew, I never, I never thought that's where it would come to. So start. And I was listening today about innovation and uh, Buckminster Fuller, another one of my heroes said that the biggest discoveries are the ones not where you're going straight 
towards your goal, but where you do a 90 degree. And I thought, yeah, I mean, these three were 90 degrees from what I was headed to do. But you know what? I'm thankful for it. I really grew in patience because I was not the most patient person, but you don't have a choice when you're growing trees. You know, grow radish, it's 30 days. Grow a plum tree, sometimes it's six, seven, maybe eight years before it fruits. I mean, it tests your patience. And if it doesn't take that long, then just celebrate. Got that? How will you get involved in your permaculture lab? Well, here's one idea, just a few questions for you. Are you going to make it all a lab or are you going to make part of it a lab? That's a question you'll have to ask yourself. Are you going to allot a small space or all the space? So it really depends on your situation, depends how much space you have. You know, you could start this in your living room window. Prototyping is expensive and it takes time. Yes, let me tell you, it takes time and it costs a lot of money, but it just depends on your situation. Consider that or give yourself a budget. Say, you know what? I'll put $300 towards doing this test. Good. Start there. And you know what? Once you've done it, you go, you know what? I could have done it probably cheaper if I had done X, Y, Z. Even established producers put in test areas. So if you're growing something and you go, you know what, you, you better have test areas. You better have a, just a test plot where you try the newest cultivars, you try old cultivars, you try something, you just try, test more than what you're doing right now. When will it stop being a lab? Hmm, that's a good question. And really it's one that, probably only you can answer. It depends on your character. If you really like the lab part, maybe you'll never stop it being a lab. When is it time to go from lab to production? Well, pretty well, if you're talking of a living system, your system will tell you because you'll start seeing, you know what, this is really working. And now you'll have a timeline going back because you've got your prototype and you said, well, this took this long and this took this long. And you know what? Okay. And then that will determine, are you going to make it a production or not? And it will never be perfect. I mean, there's always tweaks to carry out. I was impressed that even on the Model 3, which is the largest production line for Tesla, they still make production line changes. So don't think, you know what, they're sending out cars and they're not perfect. Hey, they're learning as they go along and they're making the changes as they go along. So it's going to be the same for you. You will be learning and you'll be making changes. Here's a few tweaks. Maybe you figure out a way that's more efficient. Perhaps you try a three sisters. You know, you say, oh, yeah, I want to grow some beans. Well, maybe you grow corn with it and squash. Or, you know, just try that. That's far more efficient in space, in time, and everything. Maybe you can tweak it with less energy. So when I went to see uh, Richard Perkins, uh, they had some breeds, old, old Swedish breeds that, boy, these things take less energy. I was reading a, a piece 150 years ago in our area there was the story of some farmer who crossed the lake in the winter. It's frozen. So it's a big lake. They crossed the lake in the winter with their cow. And they took the cow and they brought it into the local marsh. And the cow had to feed on cat, dry cattail for the winter. I thought <laughs> if anybody did that today, they'd probably be reported to the SPCA because it's like your cow nowadays can't live off cattail stems. Well, back then they could. So there were breeds that take, you know, you could tweak by trying breeds, older breeds, old apple, old fruit cultivars. Some of them were chosen because they took so much less of your energy, of fossil energy and everything else. Less material, maybe different material, try different plants. It's all part of the tweaks. Nature is always changing. I, 
don't think you can freeze nature in time. You cannot. I mean, I was thinking of this today, how a sunset, and I realized, you know what? There's never been two sunsets that have been exactly the same in our area because every day the sun sets at a little bit different position and on the horizon, there are trees. And next year, those trees are not gonna be exactly the same. They'll be a little taller. So there is never two sunsets the same, even though it's a clear sky. So we should emulate. Don't try to fix your system as if it can't change because nature is always changing. And there will always be an element of art to the science. You think, yeah, you know, this is pretty precise. I've got it dialed in. Yes, and don't forget the art to the science. What do we need to go from a permaculture lab to being the method of production? And I've spent some time on this. You know, well, how could we hope that this, this idea or these ideas of permaculture would become the mainstream. Well, we will need a few things. We will need scale. You'll have to be able to show these things proven productive at scale. We'll need profitability. I mean, permaculture has to be profitable doing it. But right now, I would say the vast majority of projects, we aren't in the proven productivity. We've proven a few things we've shown, we've tweaked, but we need the repeatability to be able to basically package that model. Just do this, go ahead, do this, and it works like that. And we'll also need some environmental accounting for the full cost, because often things can be produced in a way that, yes, many, a few things benefit, but at the detriment of a lot of other things. So that accountability is important as well. I wanna leave you with some homework for designing your permaculture lab. Think of these as questions and tweaks to help you think through this. Would you want this? Well, think of what bothers you. And I know many people are bothered by the idea that we grow a few acres under plastic Plastic, I used to hate plastic, I'll admit. But I realized what I hated was thin film disposable plastic. We put plastic in once for the life of the orchard. So it'll be 30, 50, 70 years. It'll still be there and it'll still be working. So, hey, if it bothers you, think of, I don't want to do that. I want to figure a way and I want to maybe tweak you. If you're one who says, you know, this really bothers me that they're using plastic. Figure out a way that we don't have to use plastic and we can actually do it without plastic with less time over many years. If you figure that out, please get in touch with me because I would love to hear a way that takes less time and gives the same or even better effect. What gets you excited? I was really excited when I first heard uh, Elaine Ingham talk about the soil food web. I mean, it opened my mind and my eyes to a whole new world that is really invisible, often right under our feet. And this year I've been really reaping the benefits of applying some of that information. We've had more mushrooms, I was saying, to my wife today, you know, it really bothers me. We're walking and there's mushrooms everywhere this year, but we've picked so much in the past that it's like, you know what? We'll just let them spread their spores to the whole of the surrounding neighborhood and areas. But that's a great thing. You, you know that your soil food web is really alive when you get that amount of mushrooms. Maybe you're passionate about. So what are you passionate about? Maybe you, it's animals. You love animals more than plants. Okay, make that distinction. What is it that you're really most passionate about? And if you're passionate about animals, look into things like mob grazing and you know intensive rotational grazing and things like that where you can really make a super positive impact on the land, on the soil, and on the animals. Here's a last one. Before you die, if you look back, what professional accomplishment 
would you be most proud of having contributed to or started? Hey, you know, when, when that day will come for everybody, we're all slated. I mean, there's no escaping. So when you get to that point and you think, you know, what would I like to look back and say, you know what, I think I, I actually did my part making this place a better place to live. So you have to answer that for yourself. But you know what? That will begin with just starting. So you have to just start. Follow my adventures. You can get there, Facebook, Instagram. I'm on there. Please take a look. The permacultureorchard.com, YouTube. You could get me there on YouTube under my, my name. Uh, maybe you'll be lucky enough, although we're really moving the, the live classes and courses and trainings, we're moving them to a master class, and that's coming soon. See the socials, I'll be announcing it. Uh, we're almost finished, and it's it's gonna be it's my last contribution to this area. Uh, with the master class, I mean, it will be, I'll be able to say it's done. Thank you so much. Another inspiring talk. We knew it would be Q and A. We've got some great questions for you. And 10% of all bundle sales will be donated to the Earth Activist Emergency Fund for Afghan release, Relief. We'd also like to add that Stefan is joining us for this year's online PDC and will be one of our guest instructors. Yes, we're very, very excited to have him as, a, as an instructor. Uh, and so Stefan, Carmen, and Penny Livingston are yep. going to be uh, on this panel discussion. And so I'm pretty excited to see where that conversation goes. Yeah, they're going to be hashing out the question, how do you do permaculture? Okay, awesome. Fantastic. Okay, let's go to Q&A. Yep, we've got a lot for you, Stefan. You want to go first? Yeah, I want to know what your favorite trio is. And I know it's context specific and it's site specific, but after all the experimentations, and it may be a quad now, it sounds like they're turning into quads versus trios, but uh, what's your favorite one? Actually, it's one that I don't have, but I have parts. So we're finding hazelnut do extremely well. Cherries do extremely well. We knew cherries, but hazelnuts, we have some that basically produce one bushel of hazelnuts per bush. Holy. I mean, that's, that's massive. And sea berry, the Russian and Ukrainian thornless sea berries, that would be, and I haven't put it yet, but that would be uh, like, you know, we're tweaking, but I love easy. Nothing beats easy. And when you put this something in and you basically step back because it'll take over, that's what you want. You want something that, man, you plant that out. And for the next 50 years, you're just going to be going nuts on harvesting, literally going nuts. Uh, that would be, uh, that's something we're still planting areas that we have. And that will be some of our next ones to go in. So how do you, yeah. how do you harvest the sea berry, Stefan? Uh, we don't. The members do. So people just come and pick because they're thornless they can pick it's not the thorny ones where you have to cut the branch and freeze it you just pick them off like you're picking blueberries and and, and berries actually because my my thorn version the berries actually stick to the bush because they want to ferment on there it seems the yeah. thornless don't do that they do but they're easy i mean they're really quite easy to pluck off so okay. yeah that's something that they the russians have worked on this for a lot longer, like we're just still discovering the fruit and they've been at it for a long time. Cool. Is the taste uh, comparable? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Like <laughs> we had a jam, uh, one of my interns one year made a jam from sea, it was like, if, if this is the future, let's get there fast because this is incredible. <laughs> uh, and when I put it out, I've never had enough. We only have a few going and the members pick it up. Like a few people really love it and they just cream them. I don't even have any left. So. Oh, crazy. What is the most insightful experiment that you have run on your lab? Probably compost tea. I mean, I got really excited. I think it was 2000. I went to a, a one day workshop with Elaine Ingham. She had to come to our area which was like mind-blowing 
here's Elaine Ingham. She's coming to our little thing to speak to 50 farmers, you know? And I thought, my God, do you know what's, what's going on? And I listened to that and right. I mean, I just, I, I looked and I go, we got vats, let's get going. And we bought a, uh, an aerator and the air stones and we can make them in uh, like 2000 liter uh, batches at a go and we started putting it on for a few years and i realized wow if i had known that uh we could have started like the transition anybody who's you take a piece of land you don't know of the transition happens so much faster because you get the life in there so fast instead of waiting a transition is simply because it takes three years to transition to organic because it takes three years for the life to return to a dead soil. But we could have had it in, you know, if we had started in the spring, knowing that in by midsummer, our soil would already be humming. And so we would have saved three years of basically waiting for things to kick in and get going. Do you have a nitrogen fixer companion planting list that you adhere to? And if so, where, where can people access, um, where, where you access that information? Uh, let me understand the question. Companion list, are you talking what should go with the nitrogen fixers? Um, I think this is, this is uh, specifically asking what nitrogen fixers uh, do you use uh, and where can people find out more? Um, there was a, there was, I think it was called TC Permaculture, had a really good listing about nitrogen fixers. I, I liked, he did a pretty comprehensive job. I mean, the community, there are people who, who geek out and he geeked out pretty hard on, uh, on nitrogen fixers. So he had a very good list. I have most of them on the list that, that could be grown in our area, except for alders, oddly, because alders are kind of a, a native plant that grow really well, except for very sandy soil. They grow in gravelly soils, oddly, but very sandy. It's, you don't see them growing wild in that. Uh, so we've tried just about everything, like uh, honey locust, black locust, uh, Russian olive, all the sea berries, the uh, uh, caragana, uh, <clears throat> autumn, autumn olive, gumi, and all those. We've tried them pretty well all. and. I'm quite impressed with autumn olive and gumi. I know some people, if they're listening from the States, go, you plant that? Yes, we plant them because I've never seen them reseed in our area yet. And so it's like, you know what? Uh, and they're doing really well. So that's a nice one. It's nice to have nitrogen fixers that aren't always the canopy species, which the honey locust and black locust definitely can be the canopy species. Yeah, yeah, and take up a little bit more sunlight. Have you ever tried syntropic agroforestry or do you have different models of agroforestry that you've tried? I haven't tried syntropic. Uh, I really love Ernst Gotch's uh, work on that. I'm curious to see, cause I mean, he really cut his teeth on a tropical environment and he is working in Portugal uh, and in the south of France on systems. So I, I'd love to really see it. It's, it's great. Anybody who can catch videos or trainings by Ernst, it's, it's really pretty mind blowing. His whole uh, system with, you know, planting the, the embryonic species and everything else. I haven't tried it. We, I kind of, I wanted to try pruning some of our nitrogen fixers in his way, which is really, you just, you take everything off and, you know, uh, but then I know that I'll really have to prune every year like that. And I like to avoid having to prune that much. Do you have the multiple diversity of layers if you rotated sheep pastures, allowing diversity to grow between tree rows? If you have sheep, you will have grass and then your first leaves of anything at chest height. So picture that, you know, stand somewhere and go, okay, chest height is where my leaves will start. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you won't have it. And goats are even worse. Goats will <laughs> eat, your canopy will be that much higher and chances are goats will actually debark your trees. So Please, if you ever want to, you know, keep your goats from your trees, bring your food to your, bring your fodder to the goats. Don't bring your goats to the fodder plants. But I, 
I, I don't have much experience. We had one goat and our ram killed the goat. Uh, goats and, and, ram and sheep are kind of close enough that they feel sometimes they can compete. So the, the males don't like each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but sheep are, anybody who wants to grow a simple system with high quality fruit, and you will get high quality if you really rotate it well, to be just as soon as you're finished harvest, you bring in sheep because they will absolutely clean up everything that you would not even know is there. They'll find it in the grass. Yeah. And that's when we had the least insect pressure, but we also had the least diversity. So it is something to consider. Okay. It's a very simple system. You can have, you can have trees, you know, have trios of trees and sheep that will work it will work very well but you won't have any of the other layers how does how do you go for pollination do you need to plant specific pollinator attracting plants to time flowering cycles and fruit crops i did uh, four years of uh, weekly monitoring of every plant that's flowering and building a flowering sequence so we did that years ago and then once you know where your holes are You'll go, oh, you know what, the, the second week of July, there isn't much, or, or maybe it's the first week of May, there's nothing flowering. So then you look around, what is flowering in that period, bring it in. And we built basically a flowering sequence that starts in our area at the end of April now, and has just finished. So we had our last flowers uh, last weekend. And that's our flower. So we have our pollinators. I mean, they have a feast and then now we leave fruit on the ground. So the, the bees, the wasps and any of the native uh, insects, they're getting sugars. So mm -hmm. we really want a very healthy pollinator and beneficial population to go into winter. And I mean, they do an incredible job. They deserve it. Uh, one, one of the viewers, I believe you were talking about this at the BYPP summit, but they would like an update on your experiment with the rabbit rolling lawnmower cage you were working on. And they're asking, yeah. how's it going? Do you have an update? And uh, they would love to see that invention. And, and other people were asking, uh, I would like to see the rabbit roller update as well. Yeah, I would love to see it too. I just haven't put, it, it needs a bit of attention. I did have an offer from a, a school um, that would like to take it on as their project with the students. So it was like a, I don't quite, a technical school. And I thought, yes, that's what we'd need because my goal for it, and I have very, you know, I've, I've used it, I've tried it. It works, but not a hundred percent. It has to be beyond the hundred percent for me to really say, you know what, now I'm ready. Let's, let's go with it. Uh, it has to have an adjustable mowing height. So the rabbit will basically mow at the height you choose, because I'd love to be able to finish with three inches of leftover grass so that the grass blades really grow fast. So if they take it from six down to three, that would be perfect. So that adjustable mowing height is, is kind of what's still, uh, I haven't figured out totally. I know somebody will come up with a great idea for it and then we'll be ready to go. Cool. And then there'll be rabbits galore. I hope some of you like rabbits because they can be cute and cuddly, but boy, they're even better to eat. <laughs> uh, we got to harvest our rabbits here next weekend. Okay, I have what a was question. Biggest for you insight. Guys. What was okay. your biggest insight? Oh, go Stephane for it. Has a yeah. question for us. Just yeah. good. Now that you've done two of these, okay, what what did you? Uh, Michelle was filling me in on on some of your glitches and so on. Uh, what did you guys learn? Because what did you set out with the idea for the book, the original release? Now it's your second one. But I mean, that's the tweaking and iteration. What changes from the first to the second did you learn, first of all? And what originally got you, you know, thinking this is the way to go? Well, it's pretty hard to, uh, you know, I mean, you're a public speaker as well. And so, um, you know, I remember getting started in this and, um, you know, starting to give free talks at the library and you'd get five or 10 or 15 people. And, you know, what other medium can you, can you use where you can get five or 600 people uh, behind a screen 
um, listening. I mean, for, I, I gave a talk on my greenhouse this time, and you know, we're we're actively uh, innovating right now on um, on climate batteries or subterranean heating and cooling systems, and you know, it's fantastic to be able to have uh, that kind of size of audience um, right right there um, and you, they don't have to pay anything. It's, it's so you can get your information out far and wide um, really quickly. Um, what did we learn? I mean, I think the one of the biggest insights was uh, the hunger for these types of conversations. So after the presentation is done, people really appreciated the longer form uh, Q and A and conversation period. And so the iteration uh, this time, which is what you're going into next with uh, Carmen and, uh, and Penny, um, are these long form conversations where you guys are gonna actually get to unpack a, a difficult question um, with thought leaders in the space. And um, yesterday's conversation with Ramis and, and, Tris. and Dakota yeah. um, was, was really inspiring. Um, and so I think the world needs more of that. I think we need to, and, and we've really seen the proliferation of podcasts and, and long form conversations in general. Um, I think permaculture needs to continue to, to host those types of conversations because it is a complex subject or it's, it's easy once you understand it, but when you're first getting into it, it's everything. And um, you just, you need to hear a lot of that type of dialogue in order to be able to, um, to really wrap your head around it. So what was your biggest insight this year? On, on your property, what was the thing that, you know, you left with just mind blown? And, and do you get those kind of mind blowing uh, kind of insights every year? Has every year kind of been marked with one of those? No, well, I guess the recent one that comes to mind is the whole episode of mushrooms. I mean, starting, okay, I've been told that it's a good year of mushrooms, but when you have to watch where you're walking or you're going to really be squashing mushrooms. I mean, that's, to me, that's a good sign. Don't forget orchards. You talk about an orchard, you talk about fungicide, right? It's like, it's standard practice to apply fungicides and not one. And people will rarely say, but I've asked in, in private conversations, I've asked people who grow and, and, you know, People would be hesitant, but they'd say, yeah, this year, yeah, we we're over 30. Yeah, over 30, over 35, 30 35 applications. Yeah. So it's like, geez, you know, places. Okay, this year has been fantastic. So a lot of people maybe got away with five sprays. But the putting fungicide kills fungus. That's what it's designed to do. So you can't expect to have a healthy mycelium uh, component in your soil and have fruiting bodies of mushrooms in abundance when you're putting that much fungicide. So it's been 30 years since we bought and transitioned, but this year uh, we're really starting to see mushrooms everywhere. And it also helps we've applied uh, two years, we put the practice of roller crimping instead of mowing. And that's a whole different thing. But that is fantastic because you actually get that all that standing matter right down in close contact with the soil. And mycelium really love that extra food of hard to digest carbonaceous uh, fiber. And it seems like, you know, they've had two years to build up and now they're fruiting. So... When do you, when do you roller crimp and are you roller crimping the grass? Yeah. yeah the aisles. So we roller crimp when the stems are crimpable. So there has to be a flowering stem or yeah. a seed stalk okay. that now is basically anytime you step on grass and it stays down, that's when you can roller crimp when it's green blades and you step, it'll come up with time. It, but there is a period and, uh, we picked that technique. It's funny how techniques, you know, it was developed at Rodale, picked up in Europe. I learned of it used in France yeah. and I brought it back and, and we've been using it. And it's like, wow, fantastic way to, they said their first year after they applied it, they reduced their irrigation by half. Huh. And, and I mean, that's, that's a lot. If you can cut your water by half, because now, you have basically your soil is covered. 
there is a soil cover over the whole of the orchard. And that's, so that's a great technique. And so does that crimped grass get decomposed by next spring? Not always, no. Sometimes you definitely, yeah, we saw it this spring even. We could still see the, the it's like a mat. It's like a carpet under your green, your green grass will grow through it, but it's a mat of dead stems that mm -hmm. are now basically feeding your fungal food. So it's, yeah, it's a great, great technique. I'd highly recommend people look into it. And have you noticed an improvement in soil carbon then in the couple of years you've been doing it? I have not. I don't test it. I've tested it once in 30 years. And, but okay. I, I do use indicators. Like certainly the, the, the mushrooms are, because we've had a super dry year here. Yeah. I mean, to be able to spray for conventional orchards five times, uh, that means it's been very, very dry. We normally get a very wet spring. I applied in one block, I applied two sprays of whey and that was it. And whey is great because it actually doesn't kill the fungus. Uh, it, so that's a super uh, product to use. Did, did any of your trees get uh, heat damage? Did you guys get to the 45, 50 degrees out there that no. we had in BC? No, no, we were seeing your things and it's like, woof. Uh, yeah, that was plus fun. it helps that uh, some of the blocks aren't pruned and so okay. they have quite a bit of you know they're they're shading especially the trunks that's what you have to avoid you open up too much and then your trunk is exposed so no we get more damage from the sun in the winter when there's no leaves right we okay. get sun scald uh, on the bark in the winter one thing I've always wondered is because of the way that you you bend your branches down uh, instead of pruning them, do you do you think you get the same nitrogen release uh, from your nitrogen fixers by doing that rather than pruning them? Probably not, because we still prune them. So once we've got, especially in nit we've been pruning our nitrogen fixers this past two weeks, and uh, once we've got them bent, they will send out branches sideways and kind of everything. And that's where we're cutting off. Okay. So once that original scaffold branch is in place, they still grow. So they'll still slough off some uh, nitrogen. But I mean, that's the lab part. We've, yeah. you know, we've been putting in the prototype testing, but we need people who would love to geek out on, I'd love to test, you know, how much of that happens. We're just going on, you know, it's like I said, it, the orchard's grown more than I expected. Uh, I didn't expect in our sand that it would grow this much. And so I space things much too tight. And now I'm kind of stuck with it. We either we prune harder or we take some trees out. And so it'd be neat to, to pull out one of those nitrogen fixers and actually try and do a count on the amount of nitrogen that they're fixing. That'd be a really neat experiment. I'm all ears. <laughs> if anybody would know, I mean, it's not just knowing how to do it. It would be somebody having to do it because I've got enough on, on my plate. So tell us about your masterclass. You, you kind of hinted at it, but let, what, give us the rundown on that, when it's coming out, what you're going to teach, uh, where people can find out about it. It's, it's everything. Um, it goes from the, it, it's going to be basically for people who haven't started. Yep. There's going to be parts of it that look, you don't, you don't have land, you haven't started, but you want to get a handle on the basics. There's a part of it is that there is a part for people who already have trees and it's, you know, heavier focus on what do you do to maintain? How do you maintain? And then there's the, the in-between, which is your basics, how to design it, understanding the soil, understanding there's a whole course on observation. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty excited on it's part, it's everything I've taught for years put into one package and it will go from, I mean, some of the chapters, observation, soil, uh, the magic model, uh, that, that one is mind blowing because I've, I mean, I was a landscape architect. I did designs. I did loads of designs and I saw what was the hurdles, what kept people from uh, even understanding their design. People don't, uh, there's about 20% of people don't understand the plan. So we do it with a model in a way that it's designed for a seven-year-old. 
So everybody's eligible. <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah. A we've whole got, lot. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, one should be quite, quite fast. And I'm curious myself after watching the permaculture orchard, but what direction do the rows run in your orchard? They they don't run in a in a, any of the recommended directions because they are actually not north south they're northeast southwest and and ninety degrees to them I have both uh, I would recommend in a northern climate or in a sun limiting climate north south that's what I recommend now because that way you really get uh, your grass and so on gets a full opening in the middle of the day if you're in a sun challenging area where you get too much sun, then actually we've seen in the south of France that an, an east-west seems to be better because you do get a shading effect and it keeps the soil cooler. You don't want the sun to hit full on uh, and dry things out as much. Uh, last one, are there any labs that you feel are the most important to uh, conduct? So have a lab where you're conducting experiments in, but haven't been started yet? Good question. Uh, well, I think it's in none of the macro stuff, but I think there are a whole lot of, you know, somebody wants to really deep dive into some very, like I was saying, the nitrogen fixing. We need people to really be able to measure and quantify. And if we want to go forward, we've got to be able to say, hey, you know what, this plant in this trio would go ahead and give us 150 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre, you know, if, as long as you prune whatever, 20% of your tree or something. Those are the kind of details that would be very, very uh, valuable. But that's, that's beyond a farm. That's a real experimental kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Combining mushrooms, for example, I would love to have a mushroom production associated with the tree. We do get some morels. I would love to know how we can get morels and truffles. There are truffles that will grow, for example, on hazelnuts. And I mean, think of it, you have the crop. If you could put a crop in that's complementary to what you already have, and that could be more profitable than your main crop, that sounds pretty crazy. But it's possible. I mean, you know, Malson's thing about it's only limited by the imagination is so true. We barely scratched the surface of how much we can pull out. And so I'm realizing, you know what? We've got too much area because we're not stepping back and, and seeing how far and how wide can we get this. And that's getting a little exciting. Like I'm looking forward to that we could pull out many, many tons per acre of many crops. That, that's, uh, I'd love to see how many animals we could put in there uh, with the trees and so on. It looks like you're at a true lab right now because your video I just know. went totally green. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that wraps it up for the for the Q and A. Uh, photosynthesize. Yeah, photosynthesize. Get less green. <laughs> <laughs> nano, nano. I'm growing palms. I'm growing leaves. Jazz butts. <laughs> I wonder, are are you per, uh, perchance friends with uh, Chris Hadfield? I feel like you guys would be really good friends. Yeah. No, I I, I it certainly would reach out to Chris. I don't know him. No. Okay. You mean the astronaut? Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. his thing about if you could sing your information that, you know, if you could, if people are really tuned into music and that's why even the thing, you know, what was the four? Uh, try, test, fail and tweak, you know, mm -hmm. if you could yeah. make it into a song, it's always easier to remember. Yeah. Yeah. I did a video good. some time ago on uh, oh. Lamps Quarter <laughs> and I sang a little song out of it and that was what people hooked on, but they remember it. So people remember song. That's why the early peoples always had songs in their oral histories. Absolutely. Oh, you're back. You're normal again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like that. That was good. Yeah, that was what fun. did you do? <laughs> I, we didn't Come do on, it. Mitch. I want to be green again. <laughs> you, you almost turned into the Hulk, but you didn't seem very angry. Intrigued. Check out the virtual tour of the Permaculture Orchard. 
Have trees already? PruningCourse.com Subscribe, please. Check out some of the other videos or playlists. There's more to come. Stay tuned. I'm growing <laughs> palms. I'm growing leaves. Shaz <laughs> butts. <laughs>